Hello, everyone. I am the very proud principal of Clara Barton Elementary School, and this is. And I'm Allison Walters. Uh, like I've been introduced, uh, literacy lead. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today about our transformation from balanced literacy to structured literacy. So this is our school. These are some of our kiddos and a little bit about us. We are a pre-K to second grade school in the Feltonville section of the Philadelphia. We are the only one in the school district of Philadelphia. Um, we um, are part of a campus, so we feed into one another. Um, Feltonville Intermediate is the three, four, and five, and Feltonville Arts and Sciences is the six, seven, and eight. Our current enrollment is about 610 kids. Um, we have 74% Latino, 19% African American, then 2% Asian, 3% white, and 2% other. We have four pre-K classes that are about 20 each. We have six kindergarten classes and our classes are large. There are about 29 students each, six first grades and six second grades, also about 29 each. And it's just the teacher. There's no classroom assistants or anything like that. Um, we have 40% of our building is English language learners and 15% are students with IEPs and that includes our two autistic support classes. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about our literacy transformation. Um, we have moved from, we were a full on, we were in it, balanced literacy. Um, and our journey to structured literacy, we're going to talk about um, why we made the shift, how we made the shift. We're going to talk about the data and then what were some of the big instructional shifts we made um, to help us see those gains. Okay, so where we started prior to 2020, we were the model school for Reader's Writers Workshop, which is the balanced literacy model. Um, and we thought we were giving our students exactly what they needed. Our classrooms were beautiful, our lights were low, our students were in nooks and reading with books in their hands and everybody was happy. But the real reality of it all is that although it looked pretty, our students weren't learning how to read. And we kind of had to humble ourselves about that reality that we really weren't meeting their instructional needs. We weren't providing them with um, the tools they needed to have an equitable and prosperous education. So it really not only was it important for us to change our model um, so that our students are leaving with success, but it is a matter of equity for us. Um, we know that we know now that um, our students that we thought were just not getting it, were really not like learning the basics of how to break that code, how to read. And um, most of our students that were on grade level were really just learning how to guess, to predict, to memorize, and to fake it till they made it. You know, reading those same um, passages for um, assessments over and over again um, so that they learn the questions and um, the skills were not translating to those long term reading success. Um, and it was becoming harder. When words become harder, they have to decode them when they become more analytical and to understand um, what they are reading. So we realized, again, after humbling ourselves um, and accepting that, um, you know, what we were, the way we were instructing, we thought was the best way for learning for our students and to see that it wasn't, and then um, move on to what our students really did need. So this quote has just kind of been our um, like our our guide, our mantra um, as we've made this transformation. And when we were, you know, fully immersed in readers and writers workshops, we were amazing, right? We did all the things we had to do, but then once we knew better, um, we knew we had to do do better. And we're going to talk a little bit about what our doing better um, has entailed. Okay, so we started our transformation um, by addressing, by acknowledging and addressing our knowledge gaps. Um, we had to learn kind of what structured literacy was, how it looked different than what we were doing and what changes needs to be made in our instructional program. 
And in order to start this transformation process, we needed to um, really understand and ground us in the why, and then move on to the how. So our why, um, the School District of Philadelphia was really starting that shift. Um, they started the shift from um, balanced literacy to structured literacy, um, and we weren't really on board with it. We implemented some parts of it, but again, we were really resting our laurels on the fact that we were doing everything right because everybody was happy and our program looked um, great. And we always had numbers around, you know, 46, 50% reading. Um, and we did some bits of the instructional program, but it really wasn't connected or done in any meaningful way. Our classrooms are absolutely reactive and incidental and not intentional and thoughtful. So we looked, took a hard look at the data and recognized that we were ill-equipped to make this instructional shift without that knowledge base, right? You can't, you can't go from one way of teaching for 20 years to another way without understanding what that new way looks like. Um, so we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, and we needed, we realized we needed to do level setting with ourselves and with our staff. And this was really gonna be crucial to making that shift. Um, we were all at different levels of our understanding and um, we needed a systematic approach with evidence-based practice to ensure that we were meeting the needs of all our learners. And that enters the AIM Academy coursework. Um, because we knew in our hearts that teachers teach children, not programs. So our expertise and our knowledge base of our teachers is what had to be increased. Um, um, having that knowledge and this reading science helped us to deliver a program that was more effective because they understood the why and the theory behind it and the science and the research behind it. Okay, so when we think about the how, um, the very first, well, when we first implemented it, um, we were lucky enough to have two grant opportunities. Um, the first one was used to pay for a cohort of teachers to go through Pathways to Proficient Reading. And then the other grant we had was used to pay um, each teacher a stipend um, once they completed the course. Um, because of our schedule and the way that our professional d development days, you know, were kind of structured, we were not able to provide time during the school day um, for the teachers to do the coursework. Um, so the teachers worked independently on the course outside of the school day. Um, and then they also participated in um, their, for Pathways to Proficient Reading, there were six um, virtual community of practice um, sessions. Teachers were compensated monthly um, for four hours of coursework and then additionally for um, the, the VCOP, so five hours, um, and then they received the stipend once they um, completed the final exam. Um, there were two staff members. It was myself and a kindergarten teacher. We had previously completed um, the course, so we were able to support teachers um, in PLCs um, at schools, coaching in classrooms. Um, and then we were also able to share out a lot of the information that was um, used in the course. We were able to share that out with those teachers who were not um, enrolled in the course because um, it wasn't something that we could mandate, but we needed to make sure that for equity purposes for all of our students that the teachers all had the information. Um, and then this year we were lucky, we were lucky enough, um, we received a, a we received a grant. Um, so we're able to continue that work um, that we started with Pathways to Proficient Reading. Now we're now we just finished um, a cohort of 30, about 28 teachers for Pathways to Proficient Writing. Um, and we were able to compensate them for two hours um, and one hour VCOP outside the school day. Um, because of you know, money and all that good stuff. We were not able to offer a stipend, but um, we had teachers sign up for the course anyway because they wanted the knowledge. And um, we've definitely seen the benefits coming through the work that the students are doing. 
Yeah, and one thing to note is that we actually have more teachers sign up the second time um, for writing, even though they weren't getting as much of a compensation. So um, to us, that shows us that they're even more committed to the, the, uh, the, that knowledge, um, getting that knowledge. Um, so the year by year coursework and teacher participation is the next thing we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about like how it started and then how it grew. Okay, so when we think about how it started, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Tony here um, because she was the one, um, you know, during the pandemic when we started to see everything shift and the world shut down and um, she was like, you have to, you know, we have to dive deep into this structured literacy stuff. And um, she may have dragged me kicking and screaming um, <laughs> a little bit, but um, she was the one who um, who really got us on our pathway there. Um, so um, myself and another teacher did Pathways to Proficient Reading and Colleen, our principal, did Pathways to Literacy Leadership. And that was really when, um, and at that time I was a second grade teacher. I was not the literacy lead, but our literacy lead at that time had gone through AIM coursework as well. Um, it was it was at that time when we started seeing, um, after having gone through Pathways that we really saw um, when we think about the know better, do better, and what kind of knowledge gaps we had and um, how all of the things that the district was bringing, um, how it connected to all of the pieces that um, are in place for a structured literacy program. So that was really when um, our big aha came. And then we went, so that year um, I was a, I was very honored to be a Limbach winner. So we were able to take that money that we get through that and invest it into our teachers. Um, so we were able to offer a cohort to our teachers. Now, go back to 21, 22, we're still into COVID. Um, we're still kind of in that virtual setting. Um, teachers are stressed. They're stressed about um, their health. You know, if you can remember that time, they're worried about being back at school. There were, you know, virtual learning was, you know, very stressful. So we were able to get 16 of our classroom teachers at the time um, sign up for um, this and three of our school-based teacher leads and five of our support teachers, ELL and IEP teachers. Um, we only were able to get about half of our first grade, but all of our kindergarten and grade Alice and all of our second grade who did it. Um, and then um, we really just like kind of did that work together again. Again, we had the foundation with the courses last year and then our teachers um, really took off with it with the um, proficient reading, uh, proficiency, pathways to proficient reading. And if anybody's done the course, it's like no joke. <laughs> it's really hard. So um, the teachers had to work really hard and they really, they were really kind of wowed with um, what they didn't know, right? You think you're a great teacher, or you think you got this down and then um, all of a sudden you're learning this whole different way about how the brain works. So it was really powerful that experience. And then, so this year when we're looking at the pathways to proficiency, pathways to proficient writing, sorry, and we have 18 classroom teachers, we have the three school-based teacher leads and then seven support teachers. So those teachers that do that critical work with our L students and our um, students who have IEPs, everyone is um, very invested in this. Right, and this kind of came out with, um, we realized that again, coming out of the pandemic, our students hadn't held pencils, they hadn't um, done writing, and we realized that something that we were really lacking was that writing piece. So this was really timely and an amazing gift that we were given. Okay, so we're going to talk about our data, or Colleen's going to talk about our data. Um, 
So all of our data points are based on the STAR assessment. And as most of you know, the STAR is broken down into two, um, two types of assessments. We have the CAT assessment, you know, the computer adaptive one that they take either on the iPad or the computer. Um, and then each grade has grade specific um, curriculum based measures, which um, help us to assess the students' foundational skills. Now, before I dive into the data, um, just uh, if I can remind everyone that like, again, we're, we're transforming through COVID during this cycle. Um, there was a lot of learning gaps to occur to begin with. And we also kind of have to accept that it's a marathon, not a sprint. So as the teachers are becoming more competent in their craft of teaching in this fashion and understanding phonics and understanding how we decode and understanding how to support students with what they need, um, our data is going to fluctuate. So we, we, so just going out into that, please be, be kind and uh, <laughs> with, with what we're doing, because a lot of what we're seeing is also that kind of soft data, that kind of what we're observing, what we're seeing um, and, and the shifts that we're seeing. So here we go. That's my disclaimer. So in 2021, um, <clears throat> now is a year we were virtual and hybrid. Um, we started out, the first column is our K to two numbers. So that's everything all together. And then we break down kindergarten first and second. So in the fall, we had 12% um, um, of our students were reading on grade level. And again, that's based on the early literacy um, star CAT assessment. Um, 16% of our kindergarten students, 14% of our first grade students, and 6% of our second grade students. Um, that is done when they walk in the door um, of school. So it's done very early on. You know, a lot of, again, we have 40% L learners. So a lot of our L learners aren't hearing English throughout the summer. They're not conversing in English. So when they come back, it's even that transform is transforming um, their thinking back into English um, from their native language. Um, so there's a lot, so our fall numbers usually are lower, but we're, our hopes is that those gains are done throughout the school year once that instruction starts kind of full tilt. So winter one, um, which is given around December and January, um, kindergarten went up to 28%, which is an increase of 10. Um, first grade went up to 19%, and second grade was kind of still only went up to about 7%. Um, then in winter two, which was March, Allison, am I right? March, February, March. Winter two, um, Kindergarten, you can see, makes a huge jump. So they're up to about 60% of our kindergarten students that are reading on grade level per the early literacy CAT assessment. Um, because they are inundated with that, um, those foundational skills um, at that level. So you really see great gains. Um, it's kind of, we see great gains in kindergarten through all the years. Um, so it, again from winter one to winter two it was about a 32 percent increase um winter two for first grade we're jumping up a little bit more we're about 24 and then for second grade we're at 18 and then um by spring our kindergarten's up to 71 percent reading on grade level first grade is up to about 28 and then second grade is up to about 22. um second grade during this time. So we're, we're closing the gap on that, those foundational skills while also teaching our students to take those skills and incorporate them into the actual act of reading because the reading gets more complicated and, and a little harder while comprehending and, and gaining that background knowledge. So there's really a lot that's happening in first and second grade um, that is, that's taking those um, foundational skills and putting them into action, let's say. And um, so that's that's a lot of what we think was happening with the data in first and second grade. And all of those students um, in 2022 were all coming, anybody that was at Barton prior to that school year were all coming from balanced literacy. Okay, fast forward to 22, 23. 
again, we do that drop in um, the fall. Kindergarten was back to to eleven to 11%, first grade dropped to 18, which was really upsetting to us because if you remember, kindergarten was at 71 in the June and then dropped to 18 in the um, first grade, so in the fall. So that was really, um, really, we, we were very concerned about that. And then second grade kind of dropped a little bit, they didn't have as far to go. Um, but then we saw the gains kind of start to come back again, because again, we're going to go to these tests are given right when they walk in the door, right in September, right in the beginning of the school year. So kindergarten's back up in winter one to about 54%, first grade to about 39 and second grade to about 23. By winter two, which is again, February, March, we're seeing kindergarten make that momentum that we usually see. 69 in kindergarten, first grade starting to get back to that that number again. So 47% in first grade and then 23% in second grade. We're still concerned about our second graders because they're really kind of not making those gains that we would like them to see. But again, they're building that foundational skills and applying them at the same time where kindergarten and first grade have a little bit more flexibility to build those foundational skills and not have to completely perform on a higher level to apply them just yet. So we're worried about it, but we're not surprised by it. And then they, we end up in spring of um, 22-23 um, with kindergarten again back up to 76%, first grade at 61%, which is pretty close to, to where they left in June. Um, and then second grade, it's at 26%. It worries us, uh, our second grades are worrying us a lot because you know that's when they go, they leave us and they go to third grade and that's when they take the PSSAs. So we really have this sense of urgency like around um, making sure the second grade gets moved up and, and this number starts to change. And this, this um, and by now we've, our first graders have had structured literacy, the ones that have been with us since kindergarten. That's another one of our hurdles is that um, that transition between our students. But kindergarten, um, they had structured literacy in kindergarten and now they've had it for a full year in first grade. So that's where we are with that. Um, to this year, again, we did our drop in, in the fall, which, um, which is something that we're really thinking about as a school base, like how do we address that? Um, and some thoughts we had around that is that, <clears throat> like we're laying these foundational skills um, and we're, we're really getting strong and we're showing increases, but then are we really solidifying that learning during the spring, during the school year, during the spring, so that they are holding on to it throughout the summer, because we do expect some summer slide, but again, the numbers are really dropping again. So part of our, our thought process, part of our reflection this year is how are we making sure that that summer slide is not as significant um, as it's been in the last three years. So now we're moving into all three grades that have had exposure to structured literacy. Like this is the first year we've been doing structured literacy with all three grades. You can see that in winter one, kindergarten and first grade jump back up again. So kindergarten went from 18% when they walked in the door to 47% um, in winter one, which was done in December and in the beginning of January. First grade jumped up to 44%. But second grade still kind of at that twenty six percent. Then this year the we it was an option last year to do the winter two, which we took because we don't do PSSAs, so it wasn't as burdensome for us. Um, but this year it wasn't an option. So now we're just kind of like biting our fingertips <laughs> and um, waiting for our spring um, numbers, which will be coming out in um, which we'll start taking in the middle of April. One thing we did do though, knowing that we had this long time frame, is that we really focused on our interventions. Um, and one success we did see with interventions is that 
although we we definitely decreased the number of students that were were being intervened that were doing um, progress monitoring, but they're being progress monitored on a higher benchmark. So for example, instead of our second grade students being progress monitored in um, like expressive nonsense words or something like that, most of our, what, over half of our second graders, Allison, are being progress monitored on passageoral reading, which yes. is a higher benchmark. What did you say, Allison? Did you wanna? I just agreed. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so that's success to us, that's that like, that's that data that we're seeing on the back end that may not translate to these numbers is that our students are um, getting those foundational skills now. But now we have to solidify that next step, like make sure that they're actually have hands books in their hands and that they're reading every day and practicing these skills and that our small group instructions are really intentional and targeted towards their the the actual thing that they're working on and that um and we're like doing our small groups we're meeting these skills we're assessing the information and then we're moving them on to the next um benchmark that they may be working on and this is this is actually data that we're, we're really excited about so this is the with the star data it goes um the early literacy is the is the assessment that everybody takes k to two um, but if you score above a 856, right, Allison, or 852? 856, okay, I was right. So if you score above an 856 on the early literacy cat, um, you have to then move on to a reading and a math assessment, which I will be honest with you is a tough assessment. Um, the math, you're like, you're doing um, math that they haven't even been introduced to yet. And you're you're doing, you're reading like, long passages where you're not really doing that in the early literacy and then you're asked comprehension questions on those long passages so this is um this is a real test of their ability to do reading and math um, whereas the early literacy you know is an assessment and you're doing those those skills but they're not as, as high as a level so we don't have our kindergartens, regardless of what they get on the early literacy. We, we as a school have decided that that is not developmentally appropriate for our kindergarten students to do. So we do not have our kindergarten students do that. And our first grade students, the first testing period, we do not have them do the reading and the math either, even regardless of what they score on the aim on the early literacy, because again, we don't feel like it's 100 percent um developmentally appropriate for them like the who like for who for what like why would we have them take this test so it would frustrate in them when we know that the information that they're going to be asked to do is, is at a, a, a standard space a much higher level than what they've been exposed to so second first grade we only have them do it starting in the second testing period which is the winter in second grade we have them start doing it right off the bat um, so we only in second grade, we only have the students that score above a 56 take the um, reading in the math. And then in June, we're going to have every second grader take it, um, regardless of what they got on the early literacy. So we're going to be really interested to see what those numbers are then. But what we have right now is in the fall, 37 students qualified to take the reading in the math um, star assessment. And as you can see, of those 37 students that qualified to take it, 22 of them of the 37 got either benchmark or on watch for the reading, which is telling us that data tells us is that our readers are like really reading and they're really comprehending what they're with their reading um, and our math um scored between 11 um 11 percent four of the students got benchmark and 51 percent 19 of the students got on watch and we started a new math program so that was just like really interesting information for us i know we're not talking about math but the really exciting thing about math was with our new program that we're doing the students are really thinking about the 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 way that they're solving the math problems like it's the first time i've ever seen them ask for scrap paper and actually use it so it's 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 pretty exciting stuff but <laughs> and then in winter one um we included our first graders and so we had 82 students that took it all together 
18 first graders and 64 second graders. And in our first graders, we had 67% of the first graders and 7% that scored benchmark. 12 of our 18 students scored benchmark on this assessment and 17%, three of our 18 scored on watch. And in the math, 45 scored benchmark and 50% scored on watch. And again, it's just showing us that like the ones that are on benchmark are like really on benchmark and that and then it, as you can see moving on that second grade um 48 percent were benchmark 20 percent were on watch and only one student was in intensive of everybody that took the reading and the math assessment so um and again 21 and 46 for math um, so that presented another challenge for us is because then we have to make sure we're keeping our readers, our, our solid readers, our on benchmark students and the ones that are like right there reading, right, and challenging them. So not only are we building these foundational skills, um, we really have to challenge our high readers to keep them high and our, um, you know, middle of the road kids on on target and moving up and then our our intensive students getting what they need so that they can catch up so that achievement gap is being closed um so that that was that's our data so our um some of our hurdles and our reflections that we have had um about this is that we know all our students have the the potential to be able to read we know that um we know that Right. If you teach a student the code and the research shows us, especially with our L learners, that they will they will learn how to read. We just have to give them the opportunity to be able to do that. We have to be consistent and true in our instruction um, and to make sure that we are um, covering those foundational skills along with the comprehension and um, and the reading um, and the actual act of reading, like marrying the two together. Um, and that's where we are now. That's like our current like thing that we're really focusing on. Um, we know that each year and not to be dramatic, but to be honest, each year that is, passes that our students can't read, it's really, I mean, their futures are at stake. There is no way that they're gonna um, reach their full potential as a learner and as a human if they don't learn to read and there the there are doors closed to them in their future and um and it's our job to make sure that we are giving them exactly what they need so that they have the future they need so um um a couple of our hurdles was first of all changing the culture of our teachers um which the aim academy classes really helped us to do as you can see um second round of AIM classes, our teachers um, were bought in and, and more teachers joined and more teachers saw the benefit of being a part of it. Um, but they had very deep connection back to uh, Readers Writers Workshop. It, it was a hard switch. And um, especially Allison, Allison was like the guru, like she went to teacher's college every summer. She, it, she was, in and um and i think yep. that helped too yeah because when they saw allison was in they're like oh okay maybe there's some validity to this um so that did really help um but it was it was a real culture change in my building and it's it's a humbling experience because it's hurtful that that um you know we have been doing something that we thought was so right and and we weren't we weren't doing what every child needed and we were completely on board with it. So, so we had to deal with our emotions of, um, you know, that we may have hurt kids and we didn't mean to. And so now that we know better, we do better. Okay. And some teachers uh, were struggling with that shift to that content-based curriculum. You know, they wanted their author studies, they wanted their cozy book rooms, but they, um, we had that, that was again a culture shift to um, content based in uh, content based in curriculum, which is also a very heavy part of um, structured literacy, and um, and we're still doing that shift. That's we're still in the midst of that shift, right, Allison? <laughs> um, 
and then teachers uh, embraced the science they saw. Um, and then we we noticed in our building, like the teachers that embraced the science of reading, we saw immediate difference with our students, like with their confidence, with being able to decode words. If you were reading with a student, you saw them working through that. Like, it's like they were given power. Like, you know, they had the power to be able to figure out what that word said instead of having to like ask a friend or look on a board or, you know, they they were had the power and confidence in them to be able to decode those words. Um, they had the tools that they needed to be successful. And that was really exciting to watch. And then when, teachers were successful, other teachers wanted to see them and wanted to, when we started to do classroom visits and we started to say, come see how this is working here. Come see how, um, you know, we just like, we started to to see the ball rolling. And then we have, um, an, a, a, and I don't want to call this a hurdle because it's not a hurdle. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing about our um, community is that um, we do have a lot of, ins and outs of Barton. And um, we do have charter schools in our areas that tend to pull our higher students. So like our green kids that are green at the end of the year often get pulled to a charter school. So we lose those those students, which we are not we are not judging about. We're not we're just saying it's a reality of what happens. And then we every year we get an influx of students who may be coming from other countries or do not have English as their second language. So you're kind of starting from square one again, which is, again, not a hurdle, but definitely a reality. And so just like really making sure that especially our L learners and our IEP learners, our, our teachers are really versed in this instructional technique as well, so that they are supporting um the students as um as they come in um and so again it's not a hurdle but it is a reality that we have to face and then lastly the pandemic like you know it's just we're finally feeling like we're getting our stride back from that um so we're hoping to see things keep moving forward should i take that raised hand or is that do i wait for the end abby what do you want me to Um, I think it's up to you. Um, I do just want to note the time and make sure that we have time for questions. Um, Sorry. <laughs> would you prefer to pause for a question now or, or finish up first? Uh, can we really quick go through the instructional changes and then we'll do all the questions at the end. Great. All right. And okay. Johnny no, Scarfo, we see your hand up. So you're going to be our first question. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, sweetie. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll just go. Yep, I'll just go through some of the instructional shifts um, that we've added and everything that we've done directly ties back to um, the learning that we did through Pathways. Um, we just know that, um, that that teacher knowledge is the most important thing um, for for our students. Um, once Once we got the knowledge and we saw like how, and I'll just use Saxon as an example because um, at first, like I found it really difficult to like maneuver and work with, but then like, once I had the knowledge, I was like, oh, I see where, I see where that piece fits in. And I see where that piece fits in. And once we could see where all of the pieces fit, um, and we made these instructional shifts, they could see, um, the value in them and we had more buy-in, um, and they were more able to easily implement them. So the first one we did was sound walls. That was one of our first big ones, you know, down with the word wall, up with the sound wall, thinking about how the brain learns to read with, um, you know, speech to print and really focusing on the phonemes and then linking them to the graph beams. And then um, we have focused a lot on um, small group instruction. Um, we are, I feel like, um, we, we have been working really, um, intensely with our tier one instruction. Um, and we, we can't, we have to be really focused during our tier one instruction, but we do also note that we have to address needs, um, in small groups. So we do a lot of work and, um, work in PLCs in looking at data, planning groups, um, 
and making sure that the time that we have with our kids in small groups is really intentional. An additional one is that this this past year we went to full implementation of UFLY. Um, last year we piloted it in 10 classrooms and we saw a lot of success. And the biggest difference that we've seen with UFLY um, is that they have an opportunity every day um, to read and write. They're encoding and decoding every single day, multiple times through the lesson. And um, we're seeing a lot of positive um, shifts because of that as well. Um, we know, again, that the connection between um, learning the letter sound and um, the, the importance of the role of handwriting. So we've implemented handwriting without tears. Um, this is our second year with implementation of that. Um, we've done a lot of work with sentence expansion. Um, teachers are doing three 10 minute lessons a week. Um, lessons are provided for them in kindergarten. They're doing that work orally. And then in grades one and two, it's done orally. And then they're also doing it in um, print. And when possible, um, we're able to connect it back to the content work we're doing in our ELA units. Um, and something that we added this year is, um, as we know, the kids are reading um, longer passages and encountering lots of unfamiliar vocabulary. Um, we realize that obviously there's not, not we realize, the world knows that you can't possibly teach them, you know, every single word. So we began to implement short um, morphology lessons based on the work of Dr. Um, Deb Glazer. Um, so each week a new morpheme is introduced and worked with for the week. Um, and this has really helped to raise just word consciousness and word awareness, um, especially for our staffs and our staff and for our kids. So there's just like two examples of two morphology walls. And then um, the second grade classes also do a morpheme dictionary um, where they're collecting words and um, giving examples. And then this isn't really anything groundbreaking, but we know that next year um, we have the new ELA curriculum rollout um, and we're excited to be using it because it's gonna be content rich, authentic texts. Um, we want them to be able to build that deep knowledge um, that's gonna even strengthen their comprehension. And um, we are also gonna be participating in a grant from Through Patton, um, which is the ECRI phonics overlay which um, is done in, conjun jun excuse me, in conjunction with the EL Foundational Skills Program. It overlays um, to be even more intentional and give them an even stronger um, structured literacy aligned foundational skills program. So we're excited about that. That will roll out in kindergarten and then the following year to first and then the year after that to second. Okay, now we're done. <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> Oh, nothing to be sorry about. This was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for walking us through your experiences. And as um, Shalaya already said in the chat, thank you also for being so transparent about some of the things that have been hard about the process. Um, because the more honest we can be with one another about our experiences, the more that we all have to learn. Um, and there's so many schools that are in the midst of this work or we'll be making the transition soon. Um, so Johnny Scrabble, um, can you start us off with the first question, please? <laughs> first and foremost, I'd like to thank Reba for, for even inviting me to this. I also like to say, without a doubt, I've been uh, teaching Scrabble in schools in Philly for over 14 years. And this sounds like an awesome groundbreaking thing that you guys are doing. And there's no way possible you can have all this without having Scrabble to help your kids even further. And another thing I would like to say is, uh, uh, is there any way that, because every year it seems like it's a drop off for summer and then they come back at a lower, is there any way some instructional stuff can be given to the parents of our kids so that they can continue to do things in the summer? That's a really good point. That is something that we we do. We do send um, a trade book home with them, a book that they can add to their library. We send home activities to do along with it, and then we also send home a summer um, workbook for the for the grade for them to do over the summer. 
and they have access to Lexia and iReady or two intervention online programs throughout the summer. So there are there are several things. And then we send the packet home with the parents that also gives them several websites so that they can utilize over the summer um, that they can also share with like daycare workers and after school um, programs that are keeping them. Um, and, uh, yeah. So. One, more, one more thing, because uh, I got to go to a site visit today all the way out in the Northeast. Uh, do you guys do anything summer at your school once school is out, like summer programs? Yeah, the summer yeah. programs are dictated by the School District of Philadelphia, and um, we just happen to never be a school that's doing it. But this summer, we do have construction work happening. So, Okay. Well, I have your information. I will be in contact with you. And hey, everybody, have a great day. Thank you. Enjoy the site visit. Yes. Um, everyone, I'm looking for hands up and questions in the chat. Um, I do have a question to start us off with that kind of builds on what Johnny Scrabble was asking. Um, a lot of the partners that I see here in the room today are reading captains, librarians, tutors, or other representatives of the out-of-school time space. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you'd like your school partners to know about the instructional shifts that you've been going through and how you would like school partners to support you in this work. Um, so can you, can you repeat that? Like, as in, um, like aim, like that kind of partnership? Sure. If there are other, um, partnerships that supplement the literacy work that you're doing in classrooms, be them tutors or in the out of school time space, like in libraries, what do you hope for those partners to know so that they can reinforce what you are leading in the classrooms? Well, first of all, and then Allison, you can jump in, but our um, free library that we have across the street is a fabulous partner for us. And they do wonderful activities with the students after school. Um, we have many of our students that go over with their families. Um, the librarian is wonderful, um, always giving enriching activities for them to do. Um, the AIM Academy has been a phenomenal partner with us again that knowledge base was something that we were absolutely lacking and it was affecting our instructional program and they just swooped right in and adopted us and um really it has made the the biggest amount of gains in our classroom um we don't have tutors um we don't have a lot of money so <laughs> we can't afford a lot of like outside programs um we do do um book trust we did it two years ago. We couldn't afford it this year, but we, we brought it back for next year. So that's great. So that gives all of our students, so anybody who doesn't know that program, it gives all of our students um, $7 worth of books to take home each month um, and add to their personal library. Because if we feel like if we can increase um, students' personal libraries, um, there would be more opportunities for them to read at home. Um, Allison, who am I missing? I don't, I think, I think you pretty much covered it. Okay. Um, there's a great question here in the chat. I'll just read out loud. We are also using Ufly and finding success. Are you using it for tier one, phonics tier one instruction as well as SGI? Are you concerned about the transition to a third curriculum in three years with the upcoming change next year? Yeah, so we're, we are using, we are using your fly, excuse me, we are using UFLY for our tier one instruction. And then we also do use it um, in our small groups. And yeah, we know that coming up with a third thing in three years, um, that it, that it's going to be a lot. Um, but we really feel like, I mean, we feel like the shift from um, like the, the school districts, ELA, um, curriculum that we're using now to the to expeditionary learning I feel like that will probably be okay because um, we have a solid foundation in um, knowing like what a content what a content-based um, curriculum is and what it entails and also the platform matches the math platform that we're using so that I think will be an easier shift um, there are definitely concerns about um, a, a new foundational skills program, especially because we are seeing so much success with UFLY. But um, um, I feel like we know um, all of the things that need to be in place for a strong structured literacy foundational skills program um, so that we'll be able to um, balance that as we need, 
I guess. Thank you. Um, another question I see here in the chat says, what systems do your teachers have in place to make tier one instruction impactful with 29 students in the class? It's hard. Allison, you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really hard, um, especially because there is only, um, yeah, it's just the one of them. I, I think specific, I think specifically about like UFLY, um, they're doing a lot of um I want to say like trackers in terms of making sure that um, when kids are having an opportunity to respond on whiteboards that the teachers have clipboards and they're making note of who's getting it, who's not getting it, who needs a follow up um, that like when we're doing like a whole class decodable on the screen, who's with me, who's not um, so that they're really able to like look at that. Um, that like their anecdotal data um, in our in our classrooms when we think about like our shared reading portion um, in first grade and second grade four of our six classrooms have support with an L teacher in there so that helps to alleviate it um, they can do a lot of front loading the day before to help make the lesson successful the next day um, and the L teacher is in the room for that shared reading portion to help support but it is it's definitely not easy it's a lot we of kids also did, um, we also did uh, a program for the past couple of years called planning with partners so um, we really had the lead work with a team um, from that grade um, ensure that, that kind of write the lesson plan which was given to us by the district but but really enhanced and um, made a little stronger by um, the lead and the teachers. And then that was given to all the teachers. So everybody was working from one lesson plan that we knew was standard space and very high level. Um, so that really helped too. So we weren't guessing what was happening or what level of instruction was happening in each room. Everybody had the same level playing field. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question I'll read that was sent to me as a direct message. Um, so aside from summer slide, what is the understanding about why children are performing lower between first and second grade? Is there anything unique to that grade level shift? So, so again, the, the test changes. The test gets a little different when you go from like kindergarten into first grade and the, and the, the information mm -hmm. that they're asking for is at a higher level. And then from first grade to second grade. And there's much more application happening in second grade um, than, in, um, than they saw in first grade. Um, so they're asked to perform at a higher level um, when they go into second grade. Um, and then on top of that, um, they have that um, summer slide. So, um, so we think that those are all factors and my assistant superintendent has to be on the line, Dr. Constance Horton. And uh, we've had many conversations about this. Um, but just last year, we really started to, just this year, we really started to, again, um, look at the sustainability, like the the solidifying of those skills when they leave in June, so that that drop isn't as accessible. Because we we, what happens during the summer is outside of the lotus of our control, right? Like we don't. I I I can send things home. I can offer supports, but I can't make it happen. So um, so that makes what we do during the school year even that more even much more important so we really track data very very heavily and um yeah try to make sure that that learning and we're hoping that next year we won't have that drop that we had in the past couple of years but i'll keep you updated <laughs> right dr horton <laughs> totally um, agree so yes thank you i have to say this just being on um Colleen and Allison and the entire team at Barton are doing just a fabulous job utilizing this resource and supporting students in general. So it's great to hear them talk about the work, but it's it's incredibly impressive to see it up close and personal. So kudos. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. 
Oh, I see someone just sent me another as a direct message. It says, have you been able to track success to see if students who have left to third grade have continued to make games? <laughs> So we have not done that as much as we would like. Um, we, we keep talking about doing it. And then like, you know, once the school year starts, we kind of get all in like our own, you know, work. But that's one of the reasons why in June, we're going to give every single student the reading and the math test before we leave. Um, because to go from the early literacy assessment to then every student having to take reading and math when they get into third grade um, is number one stressful for the students to do that for the first time. But number two, that we feel like the school next door isn't getting that true information that they need to be able to, to support those learners right off the bat. Um, because again, the early literacy is giving you an idea. It's a screener but it's not giving you that that data that you need to truly be able to um, inform your instruction going right into September. So I'm hoping with that, we're comparing more apples to apples when it comes to next year. So if we could get, we'll have our reading and math data for our students leaving in June for our second graders. And then we can compare that to the reading and math data for our third graders when they go into um, Felton Bill or Immediate. And we're really comparing apples to apples instead of early literacy to reading. So hopefully next year, we'll get a little deeper into that. Great. Um, and do you and Allison have a hard stop at one o'clock or can we squeeze in one more question okay. from Jill with a hand up? I'm fine and I'm Allison's boss, so I'll give her the- Okay. <laughs> All right, so Jill, you'll get the last question for us today. <laughs> Allison, I left you a message in the chat, and can you answer that? Read it and answer. Yeah, absolutely. Answer. Yeah, I was I was typing, and then I saw that you said I could answer it out loud. Yeah. So um, I'll just I'll read the question. It says, um, "How does structured literacy help kids with dyslexia specifically, or is there a universal universality of the instruction that serves all students regardless of cognitive disability?" Um, so what we know is that, like, and I'm trying to pull up in my brain, Tony, um, like Nancy Young's ladder of reading. But we know that like for 50 to 55% of our kids, they're going to learn to read no matter what we do. And then for 30 to 35% of our kids, like they need direct systematic instruction in order to learn to read. And then for five to 10%, and those are the kids we're thinking of with those language-based learning difficulties like dyslexia, um, they really need um, the systematic, explicit, direct instruction that structured literacy offers. Um, so there's no harm in doing it for everybody, right? Everybody's going, everybody can learn to read with the pro approach we're using, but we know that for five to 10% or even like 40% of our kids, they need this in order to be able to learn how to read. And does that make sense? Okay. Can I jump in on that too? Yeah, that okay? please thank you, Joni. Did you pull off the graphic? <laughs> you probably have better numbers. No, in addition to that, having taken the coursework, I've taken it with Allison and with Colleen, having taken the coursework through AIM, AIM is a school specifically for language-based disabilities. So even though there's an academy and an institute, they, the people designing the coursework have that in their mind, children with language-based learning disabilities. So we're offering instruction that works for all children. And I just saw somebody put in the chat, how are we you know, doing this, pushing it out through all of the schools in the district? And we're trying, we're trying hard, right? Barton just happened to be one of the schools who latched on from year one with this work and they're being so successful with it. So they're, we're using them as a model. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. Is, um, does this, even with the kids who need stronger intervention or stronger uh, instruction, it still is gonna raise their baseline beyond what it would have been without the instruction. Okay. Yes, yes. And and the key to it really is to make sure that even if I'm a student that has just that's struggling that needs more instruction, then we're getting that strong tier one instruction because if 
I'm not getting that strong tier one instruction because I'm a below grade level reader and a struggling inner, and a struggling student. I'm only being taught at this level. That gap will never close. So the key is really providing those supports at that intensive level um, to um, to meet the skills and the needs and teach our students how to read. And and then while providing them that really high level tier one instruction so that that gap has the the ability to be closed if that makes sense you're on mute jill we can't hear you oh i'm sorry uh, has there been any, am i on yes yes yeah. has there been any change in student behavior overall as their confidence and their skill in reading has improved uh we have a beautiful school <laughs> it's the <laughs> Our climate is our, our students love being here and they love learning and um, you know we we don't normally have a lot of problems with one of the panels that was given by reading aloud said that oftentimes disciplinary difficulties are really a literacy difficulty. So yes, mm -hmm. agreed 100%, which is another concern we have like we see that so that's another concern we have every child that we send next door that's not reading on grade level is that. We know that as confidence and ability um, starts to, to get lower and lower, um, that those behaviors um, will start showing. So although we don't see it here, um, it will definitely start presenting itself as it goes farther, which just adds to that sense of urgency for us. Well, Colleen and Allison, I think we'll um, let those be the last questions because I saw some people were starting to sign off for their other commitments. Um, thank you again so much for sharing the work that you've been doing. It's incredibly inspiring and I look forward to tracking your continued progress over the next few years. Um, and do take a minute before you sign out to read the compliments for you in the, the chat. There's some really nice ones there. Um, if you are joining us today um, for the first time, I put a link to our YouTube channel um, in the chat in case you're interested in catching up on any of the other Lunch and Learns that we have hosted recently. Um, and I hope that you'll stay in touch with us and stay in touch um, as future Lunch and Learns get scheduled as well. So thank you all for being here and have a great rest of the day. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you.